the new UPC, um, it's a UPC compiler based upon the GCC framework. We've been working on this for about the last dozen or so years in one form or the other. Um, so UPC is a programming language with extensions for parallel programming. Do you have your mic on? I the think mic is for the video camera. Shall I speak up? Okay. okay. Uh, UPC is a programming language intended for programming parallel computations. And it's based upon, upon C99 as the base level uh, programming language and then it adds extensions for parallel programming. It's called Unified Parallel C because it unifies two, uh, three previous efforts um, in the same space. And basically by taking the constructs from those previous efforts and putting them into one, it became unified. And the first specification came out in, in around 2001. The, the current uh, set of users are primarily on large supercomputing types of platforms. Um, the, the main specification and the specification that it's based upon now is version 1.2, and that uh, was ratified in, in March 2005. There's an ongoing effort right now to update that specification, mainly filling in some, um, uh, some small kinds of issues that have come up uh, during implementation, and also to add some new um, library types of routines. Uh, in terms of our involvement in implementing uh, UPC uh, in the GCC framework, uh, it was in this sort of circa uh, 2001 timeframe, and that was built on an SGI platform uh, on the, using the IRX uh, operating system, and obviously that was MIPS based at the time. Uh, it, there was actually an earlier effort, uh, more of a prototype effort, uh, that was 2.2. Uh, 7.2 based, and that was targeting at Cray T3E. Um, both of those um, implementations, uh, on a sort of technical side of things, used RTL as the basis of, of uh, where the most of the action was in terms of code generation. Um, the current uh, version of GUPC supports um, x86, 64, and 32-bit architectures, PowerPC architecture, and um, IA64 and MIPS. The uh, primary platforms are, are Linux, uh, Cray platforms, and also the SGI Altix was the platform that we developed the IA64 implementation on. We also uh, had a separate project where we upgraded the compiler to generate Dwarf that expressed this, the UPC semantics. There's actually uh, dwarf extensions to express UPC that are, that are part of the standard. We implemented those and then we extended GDB. Um, I don't remember which version, do you remember? Uh, 7.1. 7.1, something in that time frame. We used some of the new features, parallel programming types of features inside the GDB baseline and then extended those further so that we could support debugging of UPC programs. There's two primary web presences for GNU UPC. One is gccupc.org, um, and that has, that's the place to go for uh, the latest downloads of, of the source code releases, and also to get information on how to build and install the product. There's also a, a gnu.org project page, which basically uh, des describes some of the same information and has pointers to things like the SVN repository. Um, GNU UPC is implemented as a branch of the GCC uh, SVN repository, and it's been in place since about 2010. Um, since I'm going to guess that a lot of you aren't familiar with UPC, um, I'm going to go over a few of the concepts and show a couple of examples so you get an idea of, of the kind of uh, programming language that GNU UPC processes. <coughs> the main thing to, to understand about UPC and its programming model is you might think uh, it uses the terminology of a thread, but a thread in UPC is typically implemented as a separate Unix process. There are implementation models where threads are actually 
P threads, for example, but that causes certain language issues simply because you have to, uh, well, to make a kind of long story short, something like a standard uh, static file scoped variable actually has to be localized. Uh, and, that, and so as long as everything were compiled uh, with the EPC compiler, that will work fine, but there's gonna be some sort of rough edges in certain parts if you try to do that for everything. So um, the bottom line is, is the, the, the main intended uh, implementation is to implement a, a, Unix, a UPC thread as a UPC, as a Unix process. Um, now the process is, it's called a partition global address space type of model. And what the, what's meant by that is as you can see in the diagram, there's this, the large box is the total address space. The shaded part is the shared address space. So this is the, the part um, where the programmer declares certain variables and certain memory to be shared. Um, and in that shared address space, there's the part that's actually what we, what, what we say has affinity to the, to the thread. What that means is that's the thread's contribution to the global address space. It also means that in UPC, that you can directly access your contribution to the global address space as if it's just in a regular, you can access it through regular C variables and pointers uh, without any differences. Therefore, there's some efficiency if a thread wants to access its, the, its local, its contribution to the global shared memory. Here's um, one of the questions that's often asked about UPC is how is it similar or different to some of the other parallel programming solutions. Um, obviously MPI, message passing interface, is the sort of big dog in the supercomputing and parallel computing um, space. Uh, MPI is a library that's called through the normal procedure call interface and it's a communication library. By that it means that it, the, the programmer, um, when he writes his program, has to, has to make explicit calls to pass data back and forth between the processes. Uh, and that's going to, you can kind of imagine what that's gonna look like. And that's called a two-sided type of communication. The, the little arrows here going in both directions indicate that there's cooperation on both sides. And, and obviously it's also point to point. Uh, OpenMP is a different type of solution um, I'm going to characterize OpenMP as, being, as targeting SMP-based systems, multi-core types of systems. There is some interest in extending it across multiple nodes, but I would say that for the majority of the applications that I know of and definitions of OpenMP, it's primarily focused on a single system. And within that system, the little circles there that you see, we'll call those threads, are actually implemented as threads, uh, operating system threads. Uh, UPC, on the other hand, those little da uh, circles, we'll call it, those, those are called threads, but they're implemented basically as separate processes. And the dashed lines indicate those separate processes' address space, similar to the diagram that we had before. But the fact that they're all connected to that global address space means that they can access it transparently, as long as those, those variables and that memory were declared as being shared. One of the unique things about UPC is it basically generalizes or virtualizes a pointer so that it becomes kind of a fat pointer with three components. The, the thread component designates the thread that has affinity to the shared memory that you're accessing. If that thread number happens to be your thread, then you're gonna be accessing memory that you have affinity to. The, the address field is probably better thought of as a kind of a virtual address. You might think of it as an offset into the other process's address space or the other thread's address space. Um, or maybe more accurately, an offset into the shared, the part of the shared address space to which that thread has affinity. Basically, it's contribution to the shared address space. The phase component is somewhat unique uh, to UPC. UPC actually has a concept of being able to block arrays rather, and, and by that what it means is you can, you can say that I have an array and I want to distribute it across these threads, but I actually want it to be distributed in chunks or blocks. And the reason I want to do that is I maybe want to be able to localize a pointer to one of those, lock, one of those blocks 
and that's going to be much more efficient. So for example, let's say you had a, a 1,028, you wanted each uh, element of the array to be 1,024 um, elements. And you might want that because you're going to pass it to some sort of FFT routine and that's the size that it would naturally uh, occupy. But, it's, but you, you also want to make sure that it's contiguous within your, your, your normal kind of C programming address space. So that's why UPC introduces this idea of a blocking factor. And, and to, to express where it is in the current block, it needs to have something to do that. And that's what the phase component is used for. So here's an example of several UPC declarations. UPC introduces a new qualifier called shared. It's a, it's a qualifier in the same sense of const or volatile, except obviously it's going to talk about the, you, can, you could say the storage requirements or the storage characteristics of the, of the declared object or, or type. Um, in this case, I is a, is a scalar. It's a shared scalar. So basically everywhere uh, in the program that you, you had visibility to this declaration, you'd be able to access I independent of whether you happen to be on the thread where I is located. In the case of scalars, um, they're always allocated on thread zero. The next, the next declaration declares an array A, and it has this particular, uses this particular reserved identifier threads. And that's the number of threads that have that have either been compiled into the program or been established at runtime as a parameter when you run the program. So in this case, it has, let's say there were, there were 10 threads. Um, then, then A sub zero would be on thread zero, A sub one would be on, on thread one, and so on, and it would, um, it would wrap around. So like, to make the, make the example a little bit better, let's say threads was equal to five, and we and we actually change that declaration to say two times threads, then what would happen is you'd actually have 10 threads and they'd wrap around. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 would go to the next, the next round. And I have a, and a diagram to, to show that. The, the next declaration uses this blocking factor that I mentioned. And that's what this two in brackets is. And that's new both to UPC and also syntactically to C. It's still strictly considered to be a qualifier. It's called a layout qualifier. But it's colloquially called, um, called a block size. And that's, again, the idea that what you're actually doing is distributing blocks across threads, not, not distributing elements. So the default element size for the, for the declaration for A is 1. So that's, why you, that's why each element of A is distributed across all the threads. Um, however, for this, when you say it's two, it means it's going to be distributed in chunks of two elements at a time across the threads. And then finally, there's a conventional uh, pointer to shared declaration. And that basically means that that pointer, like the one we saw in this diagram, that pointer is capable of pointing to anywhere in the global address space. And, there, and, and it can be accessed just like a regular pointer, except that obviously, then it, it, can, it can span threads. So here's an example of the block distribution that I talked about. Um, I will say that usually when you s use block sizes, you tend to want to make them multiples of the dimension of the array, um, just because that's, that's actually the way that you're going to usually want to use it. But because this is a more general declaration, you don't have to do it that way. And, and for the intents of just showing this example, um, the three is not going to be a multiple of, of, uh, of four here, or four times four. And the reason for doing that is to simply show how the blocks are going to be distributed. So if you look at the, the way that, um, that the array is being laid out, it's being laid out in chunks of three. So the first chunk of three is on thread zero. The next chunk of three is on thread one. The next chunk of three is on thread two. And it, it will wrap around in chunks of three. And if there's any left over, they're simply, uh, they're simply left at the, the last thread. So the other thing that UPC adds, there's two additional qualifiers. One is the relaxed qualifier, and one is the strict qualifier. 
And there's a consistency model that's defined that behind this. Uh, a way to think about it is uh, strict might be something like volatile but applied to shared accesses. And relaxed is relaxed. It's also the default. Um, it, and I'll have a separate slide to kind of give you the highlights of what that means. From the programmer's point of view, if they don't say either, it's going to default to relaxed. The programmer can also, can also declare certain regions to have a different default by using these two pragmas. And they basically um, are required to be at the beginning of an of a enclosing bracket uh, to the end of that scope. So relaxed accesses are defined such that they can cross each other um, arbitrarily uh, um, in terms of either um, reads or, or writes as long as the reads and writes don't interfere. And in this case, interfere would mean that a, a read attempted to go past a write to the same location in the same thread. If that were to occur, then basically the, previ the pending read read or write would have to complete before that one could proceed. Um, in the strict accesses, simply do a full stop on all, previous, all pending relaxed accesses, um, and then they must complete before any, any either following strict or relaxed accesses. When yes, you Ian. say must complete, do you mean that the compiler enforces that, or the program has to enforce it in some way? The program doesn't have to enforce it because, doesn't have to uh, enforce it because the runtime and uh, the compiler will, will work compiler. together to make sure yeah, okay. that, that, that these, this consistency model is implemented. The question is, is, is it possible for the compiler to, to detect race? Aliasing. Race, oh, aliasing. Um, I, I'm actually not sure. Um, I, I do know that the way the language is defined, the normal C types of aliasing rules would be in play, but I really haven't um, and that's how it's implemented. So I haven't really thought about how that might, how that might be generalized in the, in the shared sense. I'm thinking really in terms of this relaxed model, how do you know when things can be ordered? Ah, well, I see. Um, basically, as I'll show, with the code that gets generated is a set of runtime calls, and when the runtime, the runtime calls indicate whether it's a shared or relaxed access. And they'll basically, uh, they'll, also implement, they'll also implement the consistency model. So therefore, if you, if you had a series of relaxed accesses that could proceed and, and they interfered with each other, it would actually be able to detect that and it wouldn't let them proceed until, uh, until um, they're allowed by the language. This is a simple example. Um, like most examples, it doesn't necessarily do anything that useful, but it does illustrate a couple of, a couple of things in terms of um, UPC. You'll see the two shared declarations at the top. The, the declaration of A, you'll see, has a multiplier times the number of threads. Um, what that basically says is there's gonna be 100 elements per thread. And if you remember the picture back there, you'll see you'll see zero, one, two, three, et cetera, right? and it would wrap around so that the next, if you looked at just thread zero, then a sub zero, it would have affinity to a sub zero. It's also gonna have affinity to a sub threads, a sub two times threads, et cetera. The program takes advantage of that in that leading for loop by, by incrementing by threads. So basically what it's doing, it's incrementing along the set of elements that it has affinity to. And one thing to note about a UPC program is when it starts, everything's running. So when main begins execution, it's actually main executing on all the threads at the same time. It takes a little getting used to. And so basically this particular for loop is being executed on all the threads that have been started uh, by main. Any, any questions? And in order to, so what we've shown here is that each thread is gonna fill in its contribution to the array. 
the, um, obviously we want to be able to set a synchronization point at some point to know that that's been done. And that's what the barrier does. The barrier basically says that everything, all the threads have to come to that point and meet um, before they can continue. And so at this point, after we've hit the barrier, we know that the array's been initialized. The next, um, the next for loop is basically computing the local sum of elements to which the thread has affinity. There actually is a more efficient way to do this. Um, we could actually cast a pointer and if we had knowledge of the fact of, um, and started at say, if, if your thread's zero, you'd start at element zero, and you would know about the layout of the, uh, of the array, and you'd actually be able to cast it to, to a local pointer, sum up the elements using a local pointer. In this case, just to illustrate how the shared, shared accesses work, we're just going to use shared accesses. Internally, the runtime knows whether you're referencing on the thread or, or whether it needs to use the underlying communication network to cross, to cross nodes, for example. So here, we have another array, which is just where each thread's going to write its partial sum. And if you notice, it's indexed by my thread. That's another reserved identifier, and that's basically the index of your, of your thread. So if you're on thread three, my thread will be equal to three, for example. So what's happening is each thread is writing the sum that it calculated for the elements it has affinity to. Um, obviously, once that's done, they need to uh, uh, implement another barrier so that, so that before the program proceeds, um, you know that that particular step has been completed. The, the if statement is basically a guard that says, um, only execute the, the, the body of this um, if statement if I'm on thread zero. And the reason we're doing that is all the other threads have, have run in parallel, they've computed their partial sum, now what we want to do is to, is to sum up those partial sums and print the final sum. And we only need one thread to do that, so we're, and we're going to choose thread zero. We could have said my thread equals five if we happen to have at least six threads, for example. So it's pretty typical when you write these programs to always use thread zero because you know it's, it's there. But you wouldn't be required to. And the other threads could be doing something else completely different than this if, they, if, if that made sense. Um, so in this case, thread zero is the thread that's going to execute that, that final uh, summing operation. And if this were basically the main program, uh, when, they, when they all hit exit, there'll be another implied barrier. They'll all reach the they'll all basically exit uh, together. So we, talked, we, we showed that uh, pointer, and it has three components. So it has the thread component, it has basically an offset into a thread uh, shared address space, and it also has a phase. In this case, the block size is B, which is, and, and block sizes are, are always a constant. This is the, the insert here shows the, the sort of general form of, of what that pointer arithmetic, the, the assignment of, the, the calculation of, of P1 plus I here, what that's going to look like. Um, you can see it's fairly complicated, and you can see it involves a fair number of divides and remainders. Um, this is the general form. It's, it's, um, it can be simpler. Um, you also see, by the way, that the first assignment to A has to deal with whether I is negative or not. And that's simply because um, it's formally defined using modulo, but because C's rules on modulo differ from the mathematical version of modulo, um, this basically t makes up for that. The, so what I was going to say is if, if, for example, B had been the default of 1, there's, it's also meaningful for it to be 0. That's a different... Uh, use case inside of UPC, but if it were zero or one, then obviously some of these divides and, and remainders would would fall out. So it can be simpler when the when the use case is simpler. Um, all this stuff in the insert is the thing that the compiler is aware of, and so the compiler would expand uh, shared pointer arithmetic in, in a in a fashion similar to this. So this is something we talked about before. The programmer can basically localize a shared pointer to have it become a regular C pointer. It can only do that if, if the object that's being pointed to 
uh, if it has affinity to the object that's being pointed to. That is, if it's pointing to something that's in its own um, contribution to the shared memory address space. Um, the new standard actually has some extensions that let you call a query function to see if potentially you actually have affinity to some other threads uh, data as well. And that can occur when on an SMP based system, for example, you might think of having multiple nodes and each node has, let's say, 24 cores. Well, all of the nodes on a given uh, CPU or processor can share, could potentially share directly that data using something like memory mmap, for example. And so if you have a query function, you could say, what I, am I able to actually cast this particular shared pointer to local? And, and, and you, you can uh, in, you know, in many situations. But, but, but the basic language restricts you to only being able to cast to a C pointer when, when you have affinity to the, to the shared data. Now this can cause some interesting things to happen because in some other parallel programming models and tools, you would only be able to access that data, the data that you have affinity to through the subsystem, let's say, that's implementing the shared memory accesses. And the reason for that is to implement certain kinds of consistency. Um, so this has an impact both on how the runtime and the compiler is designed, but because it, it makes it a lot easier for, this, for the programmer and to write more efficient code, it's kind of an important thing to have. So you're saying you would get different code if you had declared that strict? Declared it what? If you had declared the shared pointer strict, would you get different code? Yes, in fact, and I have an example of that. It might be the next example. No, not so yet, not yet. Enforcement of what? Uh, the thread check. Um, it, the, the way the language puts it is it's implementation defined, but most most uh, most runtimes will will check for that. Though there actually is going to be a call to the runtime to, to do that cast. And it'll sort of do an abort. It'll, it'll do an abort if it, it if not, but it's not required to do an abort. It's simply an implementation implementation so defined check. So the general. Piece Correct. And could you have a compile time warning if the block is not guarded by uh, or dominated by uh, one of those conditions? So, uh, uh, well, technically, there's no condition there. That's, that's just a comment. Um, and so, you would, if, but if there were context to no, some knowledge of what thread number you have, Okay, or if there was some expression, if this was inside of some if statement that had some reference to, to my thread that didn't make any sense, so um, then yes, it should be able to do that, but it currently doesn't do that. It just defers it to the runtime. This this basically summarizes some of the some of the statements that are unique to UPC. So these are the statements that the compiler has to recognize. Um, we've seen UPC barrier. And UPC wait and notify are basically the two halves of barrier. Um, so one of the unique things about, it's called a split phase barrier, and it's somewhat unique to UPC. So basically what it lets you do is you can, you, uh, a given program can say, I want, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna do a barrier pretty soon. So that's what the notify is. But then between the notify and the wait, it can actually perform other computations. So it allows for a certain amount of overlap that wouldn't be necessary. Now that computation can't really be related to um, accesses to the shared space because of the memory consistency rules, but it does allow for a certain amount of overlap. So you could be doing prefetching of some additional data, et cetera. And then what would happen is you would say notify, and then somewhat later you'd say wait. So as you can see over here in the, the description of barrier, it's equivalent to two, uh, to a notify and a wait that are back to back. What's the expression in Yeah, the expression here is basically a tag to, to make sure that you have matching uh, barriers or notifies and waits. So for example, in a big program, if you just ran around, ran around and said barrier, 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 you might not know how they're going to be matched dynamically. And you, one, get, one would be over here doing a barrier, another one would be over here doing a barrier, and that may not be what the programmer intended. So to ensure that you have what the programmer intended, they can put any, in a, in any integer value there, and those values have to match at the point that, that the barrier or the notify and wait 
um, is executed. Um, technically, in the new standard, that matching is also not required because there's certain hardware that will implement the barriers faster if you don't have to do that check. The, um, the fence operation is a conventional, you can think of it as a conventional memory fence, except that it basically applies to the shared memory, memory consistency model primarily. Um, and that just basically ensures that no references can go on either side of the fence. Um, it also turns out that some runtimes use this. Uh, technically, UPC should, should have some sort of progress thread, and the user shouldn't be aware of the, the need to pull, for example, the, the underlying communication hardware. That isn't always the case in some implementations and fence in some cases is, is sort of doubled up and it probably really shouldn't be but that it is on some applications. Certainly the language doesn't define it that way. You mean so that in those implementations fence is sort of like yield? Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. It's more like a yield and check to make sure that there's not some other data that's been coming in or going out. Um, because, because UPC uses what's, what's called a remote, an RDMA type of access model. What it means is that the, the data can be coming and going asynchronously to the execution of the program. If you looked at something like MPI, the programmer has to explicitly say, go and check and see if that you know, message has come in yet. Um, here you don't have to do that. Everything's being taken care of by the, by the runtime. The, another additional Another additional statement is the UPC for all statement. Um, the requirement here is that the for all statement has to be executed by all threads. Um, it also, it has, it's like a regular for loop, except it has this addi additional affinity um, expression. If the affinity expression is present, it will control whether the loop is executed on a given thread. Um, it's typically used to have uh, it has a couple of forms, but one form is you would give a shared address. You basically say like, a, you could, let's say you're going to operate on A sub I, and you might, you might put in the controlling um, affinity expression, you might put ampersand A sub I. So that's going to be a pointer to A sub I. Um, that pointer, uh, you can determine whether you have affinity to that pointer by looking at the thread part of the pointer and say, is it my thread? So basically, you're saying that you can control whether the whether the body of the loop is going to be executed using this affinity expression. Um, that could be optimized. Um, I don't know of any of the current compilers that do that, but it's certainly a, a candidate for optimization. Okay, so now I'll transition. Any questions here on, any additional questions on UPC? Uh -huh. Yes. Right. Right. So the question is: Is is there a way to, for for let's say number of threads to to we could think of it as expand and contract, um, or the ability to have have uh, for example you could take barrier um, to have maybe a small group of threads barrier but the rest not barrier that sort of thing. Um, I think that those are basically things that are being discussed for newer versions of the specification, but the current model is that you, you specify either at compile time or when you execute the program how many threads you have, and that's a static thing, and, and basically everything runs in parallel with that number of threads. Um, one thing you could do is you could mix OpenMP with UPC. Um, so therefore, because OpenMP has a lot of those types of things, the ability to uh, spread out the number of threads and bring them back together again in a very dynamic way. Um, so you could, um, you could interoperate, you could say, by, have, by writing parts of your UPC program to use OpenMP. Um, and the only thing you'd have to make sure there is that the UPC runtime is, 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 is a thread re-entrant. And another question, sorry. Yes. Right. So the question is, with this relaxed um, and uh, strict um, memory consistency model, 
Um, how might that be applied to, for example, atomic memory operations and, for example, to C11's uh, definitions of atomic um, qualifiers, atomic operations? Is that right? Yes. Um, the, uh, the answer is that that's also on the list for, a, for, a, for another specification update. Obviously, C11 is relatively recent. Um, I will say that the, the current round of the new specification does define a library for atomic operations, and, it ha and the library defines operations in both a strict and a relaxed consistency model. But it doesn't take advantage of C11's atomic uh, capabilities. Yes? I couldn't hear that. Could someone repeat the like question? If you are writing your library, uh -huh. and one piece library in parallel, then you must ensure that all these libraries have the same number of threads. Libraries have the same number of threads. So when you create a library. Um, the libraries um, need to be written in a way they can query the number of threads. Um, and there's, there are sometimes applications, for example, that say the number of threads has to be a perfect square or the number of threads has to be some sort of triangular sum of the, you know, of the, number, of the number of things you're operating on. But that's up to the, to the library implementer. There's a little bit deeper question about, um, I think that it probably goes to the idea of being able to have more control over the number of threads and to be able to have it grow and contract have them be able to group those threads together. And those are, those are topics for, for our new specification or for changes to the specification. <coughs> so for GNU UPC, uh, the current GNU UPC implementation, um, as I mentioned, it's implemented as a branch of the GCC trunk. Um, it's currently, the, the older standard is 1.2, that's the 2005 standard. It's compliant with that, of course. And, it's, and we're working on making it compliant with the 1.3 standard. Um, that's, moving, that's coming along pretty well. We, would, um, we typically release a, a major release once a year around October because supercomputing's in November. <laughs> and there's a lot of things that <laughs> seem to happen in that community in October uh, because supercomputing's in November. And so therefore, that would probably be the time where we're gonna finalize our, our 1.3 work. Um, the current release is, is based on 4.8, and obviously the current trunk is, is targeting 4.9. One thing is probably worth mentioning here at this point is that we would like, uh, and obviously one of the reasons that I wanted to present some of this information is we would like to merge the GUPC trunk into the GUPC branch into the GCC trunk. Um, and I, I'll discuss that a little bit later towards the end about what some of the issues are that we've encountered, and I'd open it up to, to the rest of you for suggestions and or other issues that we might need to look at. Um, one thing that we've done um, as a kind of prelude for, for managing the merge uh, is we, we have a, a, a website uh, where we keep track of um, the current differences between the trunk and, uh, and the branch. And we actually use a, a Google tool that was on a Google project to, to do that. And I actually know we've got about five minutes left. Okay, we're, we're almost there. Um, so I'm gonna, just so that we might have room for a little bit of questions, I'll just skip through this pretty quickly. Um, there's obviously a runtime library component to this. Um, what's unique about GUPC um, and perhaps some other UPC implementations is that we actually support three different runtime, compatible runtime libraries at the IP, API level. Two of them come with GUPC. One is for SMP-based applications. Another one is built off this Portals 4 library, which allows multi-node operation. And the other one is we operate with Berkeley. We work closely with uh, Lawrence uh, Berkeley Labs, um, and, and we work closely with their team, and, and we the, and the Berkeley runtime is, is much more general, has been ported to lots of different architectures. Um, briefly, in terms of an implementation issue, there's two representations for, for shared pointers. There's a 64-bit representation and a 128-bit representation. The 128-bit representation is a little bit problematic within the GCC tr structure, as you might imagine, because GCC is going to tend to think that on a 64-bit architecture, you've got a, one, a pointer that's one size. Um, and, 
and th this can be 128. So that's caused a few issues, um, and sometimes some in the ABI area uh, and, and, other, and other places. Uh, yet, the reason for having these two representations is that the 128 is more general and has has wider range for the independent the individual components of the pointer. Um, so questions were asked about how this looks like in terms of the code that gets generated by the compiler. The, co the compiler needs to determine the size of the data that's being accessed and needs to determine whether the current model is relaxed or strict, and it calls, calls the, the runtime accordingly. Here's a brief example showing what the compiler does with a particular statement. It's noticing that there's an assignment to a sub i and that a sub i is a shared array and that we're accessing the element i of that array. It's going, to, it's going to, the code that would get generated would be equivalent to the code that's shown below. It's going to basically translate that into this call to a put operation. I'll point out here that this ampersand a sub i is actually that com calcul com fairly compu complicated calculation we saw back earlier. And the, and the, and the compiler needs to lower that uh, to, to into normal kind of C uh, semantics. Uh, same thing except we're going to do a get here. So it, no, it, needs, it notices that a sub i is being read. Um, in terms of the structure of the compiler, um, you know, there's lots of other parts of the compiler, but the main thing to think about is that there's front end changes to be able to recognize the language. There's extensions to the tree nodes to be able to, to indicate whether something is strict or relaxed or whether it's shared. Um, there's obviously semantic checks that, that need to go on to make sure that the pro compiled program follows the rules of the language. Um, the, so when, the, when that first pass completes, the tree still has tree nodes that have, been, that have some UPC specific types of information in them. Those tree nodes, for example, it, it, it'll, there'll be references to shared variables or indirections through shared pointers. They're left in the tree at that point. There's a lowering pass called UPC genericize, and basically it's the job of the lowering pass to look around for those UPC specific constructs and to lower them into basically the same kind of tree structures that the C compiler would generate are, are, are simple. Um, I will mention that originally we actually had used GIMP, the Gimplify pass and we put our hooks in there, but that became a little bit problematic as GCC kept moving and so we then moved back upstream in terms of our, our lowering pass. Um, so, the, so right now as I mentioned uh, uh, GNU UPC is implemented as a separate front end, much like Objective C. And what that means is we make use of the language hooks. We added a new language hook for this genericized pass. Uh, the rest are pretty much as one might expect. Um, I'd say that the main action is in the genericized pass and also in the type compatibility hook. Um, I won't go through each of these files, but basically most of the files that are just UPC specific or in the, in the UPC direct directory. And this structure is, is basically the structure of a language dialect. Uh, you could think of like uh, object, Objective C. This is just a brief diagram to show the, ex the UPC specific extensions to a tree node. Um, there's a few more. There's a few other things, for example, having to define qualifiers, there's a few changes to define reserved words and stuff like that. But this sort of shows you uh, some new flags that are added to be able to track the type of refer shared reference, for example, and is it a shared reference that are in the tree. Um, something that we needed to do based upon, a, because of the change in the tree structures, is we had to add a hash table on the side to be able to encode the blocking factor. And this is the, the last slide. Um, there's probably a, a lot of technical issues, but one of the main technical issues that was brought up in the when we asked uh, for review in terms of being able to merge into the trunk, one of the questions was, well, why is it a separate language processor? That's a separate front end. It's kind of a problem, you know, and we'd like to go away from that. Um, we think that's fine. Uh, the only problem is that we really use this, uh, this separate front end and the language hooks, and that worked well for us. So re-engineering that is a little bit like taking, I guess you could say, an object-oriented program and putting it back, okay, and not being so. So you have to go in and add explicit uh, checks at, in various places, or there might be other work as well. Also, we didn't have another example. So, for example, if Objective C went down this path ahead of us, then we'd be able to say, okay, we see how they did that, and then we could kind of follow suit. It's kind of 
<laughs> well, it's, it's a good example for us, but everyone seems to agree it's a bad example. <laughs> We don't support C++ right now because UPC is only a C99 dialect. Okay, it's not a C++ dialect. So there's no equivalent of object C++, for example. Uh, one of the issues... There's, yeah, there's, so there's no UPC++. Um, so, so that's, I think, a, an active issue for us, uh, and it's something we definitely need to pursue. I did try to implement that, that fix, and it, and it sort of became out of scope for me because, because I didn't really feel comfortable going in and just you know, banging away at various parts of the compiler that hadn't been banged on that way. And so for that, we were probably going to need to solicit some help or get further feedback um, because we do have something that works within the, the structure that we started out with. The, the next kind of subtlety here is that we do lower to this what I'll call simple uh, tree structure definition, but we still retain some information that a pointer points to a shared object. We only use that as a container. So again, back to our little diagram, it could be a 64-bit container or a 128-bit container. We have lowered all the other operations into their sort of C equivalent, but technically the, the to really be uh, still fall within the definition of simple, we probably need the definition of simple extended, or we'd have to go back and figure out a, you know, some further lowering, I suppose, uh, which would be difficult, because I tried that, and um, there were some complications. And the last one is it's just a, it's both a kind of observation about how it's currently, how, you, how UPC is currently implemented, and also a suggestion that we might look for different ways to do things. So, so basically, when you declare all those shared variables, something needs to know the collect, where the, what the collection of shared variables are across the linked program. It also needs to lay out those shared variables to know how, how they're going to be laid out in shared memory. Uh, we do that using linker sections, so ELF linker sections. Um, seemed like a good idea at the time. But the problem that it creates is that not many other tools do that. Okay, that, that not many other tools use these linker sections. Um, and we even go to the trouble of making those non-loadable linker sections if, if, you can, if the linker will support that. And we do that by modifying the existing linker script. That also seemed like a good idea at the time, um, but obviously it can be problematic. Um, so, so that's just an example of some of the, that, I don't think that's a gating type of technical issue for us to be able to merge into GNU PC, but just an observation of some, of, you know, some things, some other technical issues that would have to be addressed. Thanks. <laughs>